Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar on roadway drainage. Um, we are so pleased to be able to have North Carolina LTAP and specifically their instructor Scott Tyson, who's a colleague of ours with us to be able to provide not only this webinar, but the next two in the series. So this is actually a three part webinar on roadway drainage. Uh, this is Victoria Beale with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I'm going to do a couple quick housekeeping items, and then I will turn it over to Scott, who is here with the information that I'm certain all of you want. Um, first off, I want to mention that we do have some handouts in the handout box for you. And if for some reason you can't download these, I will email them out to everybody after the webinar as well. Um, but we do have for you a copy of today's slides, and then we've also put um, the flyer for this entire series in there in case you need to sign up for parts two and three. And I also included a couple of flyers for some other upcoming webinars that we're offering on the um, Rural Roadway Departure, our forward series, and a really more of an Ohio specific webinar on TIMS and GCAT, which are two programs utilized in Ohio. Um, traffic information mapping system and then the GIS crash analysis tool. We're calling that our double header day because we really miss baseball season, or at least I do. So anyway, those handouts are there for you. Also, there's a question box on the GoToWebinar panel. And this is where we'd like for you to ask us any questions during the webinar. I'll be on to read those off to Scott as they come in and um, I'm able to work them into his presentation. But if you wouldn't mind right now, if you could just drop me a hi or hello in that question box so I know that you know where it's at and we're all set for you to be able to ask us questions there. Good afternoon. Yep. Thank you guys. I appreciate that. I see somebody did raise their hand. We're not going to use the raised hand feature. Sorry, that's just um, too difficult for me personally to try to work you in conversationally and mute or unmute you. So um, please just use that question box instead of the raised hand feature. So with that, that's all I have. So Scott, it is all yours. Victoria, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in this afternoon for giving up an hour of your day to spend it with me. I really, really appreciate that. To give you a little idea of my background, I've been with an LTAP since about March of 2008. I started uh, with the Florida LTAP, was there for about nine years when it was at the University of Florida. And then in 2017, I transitioned up to NC State here in Raleigh and have been working with North Carolina LTAP uh, during those three years as well. So a, a lifelong LTAP person. Uh, my background is with public works and dealing with contractors, a little bit of DOT. Uh, my first job uh, in a work zone was flagging. That's where I started, but I have experience in uh, work zone, drainage, guardrail, some asphalt and concrete as well. But that's a little bit about me. Uh, we'll talk about uh, that a little bit more as we go through. Uh, just to give you an idea of where we're going today, this is a very basic overview, a basic outline of drainage maintenance. Uh, for a more, uh, for a deeper dive, hopefully we'll have that opportunity as time progresses, but we really wanted to make this as basic as possible, understanding not only is Ohio attending, but multiple states are attending, so we wanted to be as generic as possible. But that's where I come from. Here's my contact info. If you're interested, you can reach me uh, via either phone or email. I'm going to recommend that you email me simply because that work number sometimes forwards, sometimes it doesn't. So email is always going to be the best opportunity uh, for you to contact me. Any questions that you may have, anything that we can help with, we are very grateful and very glad to have that opportunity to assist you in any way that we can. So because we only have an hour and we, we want to get in as much as possible, I want to give you an idea. I've got four goals today of where I want this, this webinar to go. And the first goal is to let us know how important it is to get the water off the road. We need to drain the water before it gets to the roadway or once it's on the roadway, get it off as quickly as possible. I want to talk about how important understanding drainage components are because if any component breaks, down, then unfortunately our drainage system is not going to work. And then I want to end with worker safety, which to me is probably the most important factor of any construction or any maintenance project is that we're taking care of our workers. 
here's an example of something I do not want you to do. You can see our gentleman is there in the in the little trench there. He he's there, and anyone who has worked around either a maintenance or a construction project for any length of time knows that over time this bucket is going to drop, it's going to lower, and eventually, and unfortunately, that could be a very tragic end for our gentleman right here. So please don't be like him. Um, when we're talking about safety, I want you to be thinking about ways we can keep our people safe, not just to minimize our liability, even though that's an important uh, aspect to what we do, but I also want to maximize the ability for our people to survive and come home at the end of every day, because the goal at the end of every day is to go home. Here's some ditches being pulled back in the day. We've certainly come a long way uh, from when this uh, was the standard for pulling ditches. Here's an article from the engineering news record. This dates back to 1936. You can see that they're putting down the geotextiles. We still use geotextiles today. So some methods have changed, but in general, we still follow a lot of the patterns that were set in previous generations. We talk about drainage and we'll say it this way, drainage, drainage, drainage. To, to get rid of problems, to prevent drainage problems, there's a couple of things we have to establish early on and that is water flows downhill. And I'm not sure what all experience is on the call, but I can tell you from my experience working in the field, that was often difficult for homeowners to understand that water would flow downhill. For example, if their home or their property was in a valley or was lower than, uh, and there was property above them, the water tended to run off and run down on theirs. And sometimes they had trouble conceptualizing, it's going to go downhill, water does not flow uphill. The other thing we need to establish is water is going to flow somewhere. It's just going to happen. And if it's not flowing, then we have major, major problems on our hands. And the major problem we have on our hands is that water is public enemy number one. We can see in this picture right here, there's a lot of water sitting not only on the side of the road in the shoulder area, but it's also now encroached into the travel lane. And whereas as kids, we don't realize that water causes such a problem because we love to play in it, we love to swim in it. But for us in construction and maintenance, water is the enemy that we fight every day. When we're designing our streets, when we're designing our drainage systems, it is focused on making sure that we keep the water away from the roads. And to that end, there are actually seven different parts of a good roadway, and we're going to tie our drainage system and our roadway together in our webinar today. There are really seven basics to have a good road. And the first basis is get that water as far away from the road as you can, as quickly as you can. Whenever we're building roads, we try to make sure they're built on as firm a foundation as possible. We use the best materials that we're able to pull. We're careful not to pull from all areas of the state. For example, if you have a coastal area and the sand is very granular, it's the beach type sand, you may have that there, whereas on the western part of the state, it may be clay. So you would not want to mix those materials. You want to make sure you use the best materials for the area that you're currently working in. When you're laying those layers out, you want to make sure that we're compacting them properly. We're getting as good a compaction as possible not on Thursday, but on Tuesday's webinar, we will talk about compaction. We'll show some pictures how important it really is for our roads to survive and last a very good long time to get as much uh, bang for our buck as we can. We wanna talk about designing for maintenance. When I began working in public works, I learned very quickly that we don't always design our roads and our drainage systems to be maintained. Working in the maintenance office sometimes is very difficult to keep the maintenance up on those. We need to design on the construction side for us to be able to maintain them. We have to take into consideration what kind of traffic are we going to have on the roads? How heavy is the traffic going to be in terms of volume, but also on the loads that are being carried? We need to take that into, effect, into account. And finally, you need to know that we have to protect what is out there. We have to spend as little as we can because where I was working, we didn't have a ton of money to pull from. And especially as COVID-19 has impacted our country and really the world so much, we've seen gas taxes no longer being uh, collected at the rate they were because people aren't driving. So we can see that the numbers have dwindled as far as where our budgets are. So you wanna make sure you protect your investment by doing good maintenance, by doing good proper maintenance as well. Why is the water so bad for the road? 
very simple. You can see out here on the right hand side, we've got water that is standing right there. And that water is now spilled over into the roadway and a vehicle coming down that road. Once they hit that water, very good chance they can hydroplane, number one. Number two, if the water is standing too high, it could obviously shut an engine down. So we need to get that water back as soon as possible or build it up in such a way where the water will drain before it gets uh, to the roadway. When water actually makes it to the roadway and it infiltrates the roadway, we tend to see something like this. And we can see the pavement failure that has taken place on this particular stretch of road. And you can notice if you look at it, it's it's very cracked. It almost looks like a, a cracked animal skin. Sometimes we'll use the term alligator cracking to describe the pavement failure that we're experiencing. What that really simply means is the water has found a way to get under the pavement, under the base, under the subgrade, and it's wearing it away. And what will happen is what happens underneath will eventually make it to the surface. And we'll begin to see that these roads are going to begin to deteriorate. We're going to have to get those fixed as soon as possible. One of the hidden or not notice pavement failures happens a little like this. And if you take a look out here, you can probably understand exactly where this is coming from. We have vehicles that are pulling off on the side of the road and are, we see rutting taking place. We see holes that is in the soil or on the shoulder, but eventually what will happen is that water that is here is gonna migrate itself up underneath that pavement. And eventually you're gonna begin to see cracking that pavement's going to begin to fail, which means we now have to add that into our work program. We need to get that, that area repaved quickly enough to make sure it's not causing damage to vehicles, it's not inhibiting traffic. So we want to make sure to limit these types of situations as much as possible. And to that end, I'd like to show you a little schematic here. And I'd like for everyone to participate. So here's a schematic, a drawing of a roadway. And you can see here's the roadway, there's the crown on it right there. We have our shoulders on either side. What I'd like you to do is go ahead and put in the chat box or in, in the, uh, the question box. Give me some ideas of some typical things that you have seen in your experiences and in your areas that have led to really poor drainage. So go ahead and, and type those in if you would. And then Victoria is going to, to give us some of those. We're going to talk a little bit about that. I will read them off as soon as they start coming in. Sloping, clogged basins, mm -hmm. no ditching, blocked ditches, little or no crown, clogged mm -hmm. underdrains, drainage ditch filled up, not cleaned out, poor berm, filled in ditches, no mm -hmm. swale on less, less side, okay, inverted on the left crown, side. Mm -hmm. existing flat terrain, base failure, ditch line not deep enough, insufficient slopes, mm -hmm. underground springs, um, Berm too high, accumulated sure. material under guardrail, high yes. water table, unsealed cracks in roads, slope, lack of ditch maintenance, flat ditch slope, under drains clogged. Slow down and there for a second. That's, that's okay. Hey, take a breath there. And yeah. there's not one thing that you've read or that has been mentioned that is not a problem and a challenge to good roadway drainage. Um, even if it's just high shoulders on the side where there's nowhere for the water to go, each of those things that have been outlined, that have been discussed, are all issues and challenges that we as maintenance individuals and as construction individuals deal with on a daily basis. Someone mentioned uh, not an inverted crown or not having a proper crown on the road. We did a training exercise, and this is a number of years ago for the LTAP. Um, I won't say the area, but Unfortunately, they had one motor grader operator and he passed away tragically of a massive heart attack. Well, what they had done is they had hired a bunch of, of young people out of high school and just called them motor grader operators, even though they'd never set foot on the equipment. They had never turned it on. They didn't know what they were doing. So we came to do a heavy equipment course for them. And I'm standing in front of the classroom. We're talking about putting a crown on the road. And one of the young men in the back raised his hand and asked the question, and I quote, does that mean the road has to look like a crown? You know, sometimes as an instructor, you have to bite your bottom lip and be like, son, no, that's that's not what that means. But he had never heard of the idea that the road needed to have a crown on it, that it needs to go up to an angle so the water will slope down on the sides and go where it needs to go. Well, that's good that we put a crown on the road and the water slopes down to the side. But if the sides look like this, we may still have troubles. For example, we have a shoulder drop off right here by the pavement. And if you get out here, you can see there are vehicles that have pulled over and stopped. And you see the rutting that those tires are causing. That's an issue in and of itself because that's going to gather water. It's going to hold water 
underneath. But another thing I want to point out, and we definitely know this when dealing with pavements that may not have the safety shoe, uh, which is a device that was developed uh, by Federal Highway. When you have this pavement exposed and that big of a drop off, as vehicles go off the road or get too close, that tends to crumble. And that's going to cause pavement failure because as that crumbles, the cracks are going to continue to lead back to the center of the roadway. So we want to make sure not only that are we worried about these drop offs here where we have water accumulating, where there's rutting taking place, but also are we keeping the shoulder built up even with the pavement so there's not such a large drop off because not only for drainage purposes, but also for runoff the road crashes, we have to take a look at that as well. We talk about more poor drainage causes. If you take a look, you have water coming down the inlet, um, but it's never actually making it where it needs to go. We, are, we have caused erosion on this. And just to make it a little more clear of what I'm talking about, take a look at this right here. And you can see the water will go to the inlet, but rather than going up and over it like it should, you can see where erosion has taken place. Now the water is not entering the inlet as it should. In fact, it's just going to the base where the concrete is and then dispersing its own way. Even if this were built up and this were properly maintained, you could see we would still need to keep this cut back because that's blocking the inlet. And so the water would not flow the way that we would want it to do so. So that's another issue we will discuss in future webinars is making sure that we keep our inlets and our junction boxes and we keep our, our, our drainage system clear and free of debris. Depending on what part of the area and country you are from, maybe this applies, maybe it does not. It does apply where I'm at in North Carolina and we use the term frost heaves where you will have cracks in the pavement or chunks missing. Water will fill those areas and then it will freeze. And then what happens to the pavement? Well, the pavement's going to expand because that, that water that is now frozen is pushing it further out. Eventually, that water is going to thaw back to a water state. The problem is now that pavement that expanded has now contracted again. And so you begin to have cracking, you begin to have issues and problems there because of the holes that were already existed. We want to patch our potholes and get things filled in as soon as possible uh, to prevent some of the damage that frost heaves will create. We talk about drainage systems and how they're supposed to function together very, very well. What I would hope you, none of us would think was a good idea would be something like this, where we have the pipe to drain the water off the roadway, but it appears uh, they decided to just put a chunk of concrete over it uh, to hold it down. That's not the proper drainage system. That's not going to hold that pipe in place over time. It can cause bending to the pipe, depending on what kind of material the pipe is made of. That can very easily slip off. So you want to make sure that the drainage is the drainage system is correct there. But also when you have a slope this badly, and though it is not a guardrail class, I do need to mention it. Those posts are not connected as they need be. In fact, if I were to show you one drainage system that had a slope failure, I think you would agree with me. And that's something like this, where the slope has failed for so long over such a period of time that now we have to worry about those posts sticking into the ground and if a vehicle goes off the road there and strikes the guardrail that guardrail is not going to function the way that it was meant to do it's not going to absorb the impact and once it absorbs the impact it's supposed to send that impact down the guardrail well it can't function properly because it's not set up properly because that slope is, has worn away so we want to make sure that we address slope failures as soon as possible again not just for liability purposes but because that might be my wife or my wife and my kids, or your children, or your family driving down that road. And we want to give the guardrail system the opportunity to do what it was made to do, and that is uh, prevent going any further down that slope. We talk about draining the roadway. There are ways that we can protect uh, the roadway structure, and that first one is go ahead. When you have cracks, you need to get those sealed as soon as possible. The longer you leave those out, the more pronounced they're going to become, the more damage that can take place as water begins to infiltrate through those cracks. We want to make sure that all of our potholes are patched properly. Now, I remember uh, working in the field. Here's how we patch potholes. We threw cold mix into the pothole. I'd tamp it down twice, run it over the back uh, with my pickup truck, and I moved on to the next one. 
and that's how I was taught originally how to patch a pothole. Now we know that's not what we would use uh, to properly patch it, but in some places that is still done. Here's the issue, three months later I would come back to the same pothole, it would need to be refilled again, and it was larger. So we want to make sure that we are applying proper patching techniques to make sure we maintain the structure of the roadway. We want to make sure our shoulders are sloped properly. We want to make sure our ditches have been cut properly. And we talked about that in the schematic as you all were giving some answers uh, to what are some of the drainage problems. If the ditches are not cut back, if they're not cleaned out well enough, that absolutely causes issues. And eventually those issues are going to lead to water getting up underneath the roadway. We want to make sure our pipes are clear that they're flowing properly. Uh, we want to make sure that there's not erosion taking place around the roadway, but also around the piping. We'll use the term scouring in these webinars, and by scouring, I mean as the water comes forward, comes through the pipe, it will oftentimes begin to wear away at the base of the pipe where the water is coming forth. For example, you have a corrugated metal pipe, and that water running through it at such a high velocity over time wears away that corrugation. So we want to talk about scouring a little bit. We want to make sure that our culverts and our pipes uh, remain clean, they remain unrestricted uh, for the water to flow properly through our drainage system. Now here's some really nice uncracked pavement surface. It looks really good. It's the kind of roadway everyone wants to, to drive on. It looks nice, it's aesthetically pleasing, but unfortunately when drainage systems fail, we end up in a lot of situations where we have to go back and we have to fix the roadway. And sometimes they look a little something like this. And you can see they put cracks or they've sealed the cracks rather to make sure that, that roadway uh, stays as solid as possible. When we seal those cracks, what we are doing is we're preventing any further water infiltration and that's important to do. Now, maybe they would come along and maybe they'd mill and resurface that, but again, it depends upon what your budget is. It's a lot cheaper to seal the cracks than to come down and lay down brand new mat and a brand new pavement. So it's important that we be on top of, of these drainage issues, but also when rains happen, and I don't know where you're at, but I will always recommend these if you're not doing them, rainy day patrols or something we're gonna discuss towards the end of the third webinar and uh, what we need to be looking for and what we need to do talked about patching potholes and I gave you uh, my experience of, of when I began doing this. You want to make sure that when you are patching a pothole, you're pinching those joints as tight as possible. Again, we don't want any water to infiltrate the areas. That means it needs to be very tight, pinched tight. However, when you're doing that, and this is going to be the first example I want to talk about, make sure when you're pinching joints around uh, patching potholes, that you keep your hands, you keep your feet out of the way. Worker safety is very important, especially when you're doing a job like this. It's very easy uh, to get lazy or not pay attention. We want our workers engaged when they're doing this because this is a good way uh, to get hurt. So this would be the first example that I have of making sure that we're meeting our, our roadway safety and our worker safety. Here's a really good water resistant shoulder that's being maintained. In other words, the water is going to flow down the vegetative lining and hopefully go out here to what looks to be a, a special drainage feature. That's really good and that really shows the idea of how water resistant shoulders should look. Unfortunately, and this is very true, if I were to leave my house from about five minutes from my front door, I could take you and show you this. And again, it's very poor water resistant shoulder. And this particular drainage component, if it's not resisting the water, the water is going to do what? Well, number one, it's going to cause more of this damage. It's going to cause it to be depleted, this soil, but it's also eventually going to splatter and migrate from here into the roadway. And you can see there are very large vehicles coming down that road. And whether large vehicles or small vehicles aren't really the issue. The issue is we want to get our shoulders as water resistant as possible because remember shoulders are meant to do what well they're meant for having an area for a driver to safely pull off in an emergency number one it's not resisting water but number two that doesn't look like the place that I want my wife and her her Caribbean blue Kia Soul to pull off of that would not be good for her vehicle in an emergency so we want to make sure that we keep these as water resistant as possible but, but as maintainable as possible as well you can see on this turn right here the shoulder needs to be sloped properly, but you can also see there is quite the gap there and there's quite a drop off as you can see right there. 
Now the question I would ask for the group, and feel free to please weigh in uh, with the answer box, what are some of the reasons you might see this on a travel way in your area? I'm waiting for the comments. In Victoria, to come we have in. a couple of answers on it. Yep. Here we go. Truck turn okay. radius too small, off tracking, big trucks turning, roadway radius mm -hmm. isn't correct. Car is cutting the corner, large trucks not be able to make the turn, needs berm, farm equipment, bad drive. Um, too tight curve for trucks, truck pull off for gas station, mm -hmm. narrow shoulder emergency pull off. Yeah, there's quite a few in here. Poor compaction, lack yeah. of berm, width through curve. So a lot of people said the same things too, and, but in a little different way. And, and if, I were, if I were to guess to me, Victoria, correct me if I'm wrong, that's about 15 different uh, items that have been thrown out about Hell issues and concerns over this. Yep. And you take a look at this, and this this is not uncommon. This takes place all over the country. And yet each of those components very well could explain, or multiple could explain this, but yet these items sit for months and years at a time. And eventually, and you can you can see if you look along that along the pavement, there's some cracking already taking place. Again, the water will make it underneath it. We want to get this out there. We want to make sure the shoulder is properly sloped that it's built up. We don't want the shoulder so high that the water will flow back onto the roadway. We want it sloped at an angle where the water will flow away uh, for, from the roadway and get it as far away as possible. And yet, when one drainage component fails us, when one area is not working, the shoulder is not sloped the way it needs to be, we see the potential of the problems that it can cause. It's not just an eyesore, but it's actually damaging the roadway and all of us eventually are going to be paying to have that replaced if we don't get those things addressed as possible. And you're right, very tight turning radius, especially for larger vehicles. Uh, maybe maybe the, the turn radius, what it wasn't designed as well as it should have been. But unfortunately, if we're not gonna go in and, and uh, change that turning radius, we're gonna have to make sure that we keep that slope uh, proper and that we keep it built up. Scott, now, there's a question that came yes. in, I think actually refers to a previous slide. It says, what is a pinched joint? If you don't mind, I'll go back to that really quickly. What you're doing is you're making sure that you're pulling where the bad pavement, you take what you do is you take the bad pavement out when you're doing when you're patching a pothole, and then you're gonna put the new pavement in. But you've cut it off in a square. So you, what you want to do is pull that new pavement into where the older pavement is going to be. You want to pull that as tight as possible so there's nothing in between. Nothing can infiltrate that. You keep that, uh, we call it pinching a joint. You pull it and push it in as tight as possible. That's what we mean by pinching a joint. You keep it where one starts and one begins and you can't tell a difference in between because you've got it so tight. Um, if all you're doing is throwing down mix into the hole and moving on, eventually that's just going to give way again and have to do it again. When we're properly uh, patching a pothole, we, we pinch those things or pull them as tight as possible, fill them as tight as possible. Now, I don't know if you can see this on uh, your screen. I hope you can. We can see there's water sitting here in the roadway. But if you look on the left-hand side, notice they have a sign there. It says no wake zone. And I assume they put that up there because this is not the first time the roadway has flooded. And if this is not the first time the roadway is flooded, in fact, I'm going to make a guess here. This has happened many, many times. Then we all know that over time, these cracks are going to be in the surface. They're going to have to resurface or mill the entire roadway to get it fixed. So obviously people are aware in that area that this is not a new phenomenon, but this has been happening for, for some amount of time, which can tell us that there's probably a, a significant amount of damage in the roadway. You can see there's some damage right there um, in that picture. We talk about drainage components. I wanted to, to give you a little bit of a schematic or an idea. Obviously, we're all familiar with the pavement that goes on top, and you can see where we had the pavement. We, we send it at an angle to get the water to drain off. Underneath the roadway, what, what people don't often see is you're going to put your pipe in here, and notice they put the pipe. We're going to talk about getting good compaction over the next couple of webinars. You get that tight in there so that pipe's not moving, it's not shifting, it's not going to settle. It's on a firm foundation, which is one of the things that we talked about. You go ahead and get your aggregate in there and around it, and we will put fabric in between, between the aggregate. We have soil particles on top. We get compaction on that and get it tight, get it as thick as possible long before we put the pavement down. 
once the pavement goes down and the traffic is putting its weight on it, you can tell that it will push down, but hopefully we'll get the air voids out and we'll talk about this uh, in the second webinar where that stays compacted and there's no give on that. And to that end, I wanna go ahead and ask the first poll question uh, if we can. You got it. Let me get it put up here. Yes, ma'am. All right. It's the one about preventing drainage mm -hmm. problems. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Make sure I got that up. Okay. So it's up there. To prevent drainage problems, we must remember water flows downhill. Water must flow somewhere. If water is not flowing, there's a problem or all of the above. And you can select one. So we're got folks voting and usually I like mm -hmm. to try to get us over at least a, an 80% on the voting. So, and some I folks are putting it, people today. Yeah, some people are answering in the um, question box too. If you can't get the okay. poll to actually take your answer, it's because you're in full screen mode and you just need to exit out of full screen mode and it should then accept the answer in your poll box. That's something I've learned as we've been offering these webinars. So, yeah, it looks like the majority of the people were listening because uh, I think awesome. Yep, here we go. We're up to 80%. I'm going to close this poll out and share the responses. We have 1% mm -hmm. that said water flows downhill, and then the other 99% said all of the above. So I'll hide those responses and turn it back over to you. Okay. And thank you so much for everyone who participated in that. And it is all of the above uh, for the individuals or individual who, who talked about water flowing downhill. You're absolutely right. Water is meant to flow downhill. That's what gravity does. But it also uh, maintains the other two answers as well. In other words, it's got to go somewhere. We don't want water sitting at any given time. And we see this drainage component that we have on our screen. But let's talk about some components that are very common around the country for us. We have a curb and gutter section right here. You can see what? Well, the water is supposed to flow. It should, it should flow into the grade. It should get the water, keep the water off the roadway. But the problem is, and I don't know how it is for you, but when I worked in the field, there were so many things to keep track of. I just didn't have enough hours in the day, and I didn't have enough man people or people then. We certainly struggle now with keeping the level of employees that we need to keep up on all of our projects. And too often, because of those challenges, we end up with situations like this, where the gutter is blocked. The water should flow properly to the gutter, but unfortunately, it can't get around where the vegetation and oftentimes the debris is set. What do we need to do with this? We need to come in. We need to cut it back, clean it back, so that when storms happen and when it rains, the water flows where it needs to do, where it needs to go. We have a catch basin. We'll talk about drop inlets and junction boxes. Those are very good to have. We want to make sure that they stay clear. We could cut this back, maybe clean that out a little bit, but it looks like it still should function uh, pretty well. Take a look at this picture for me. We've talked about water flowing downhill. You can see it's moving a massive amount of water. The inlet is working, but you can see one of the issues, especially in the fall when the leaves begin to drop, is the water is going to carry those leaves down there. And sometimes, depending on how long the rain lasts, how many leaves are on the ground, we might end up in a situation where those leaves actually are blocking that particular inlet. So once the rain is over, once that's been complete, we want to make sure we get out there, get those as maintained as soon as possible. Again, this is a good example of why we need a rainy day patrol. In other words, when it's raining and there's nothing going on, send our people out there to, to check and see, are the inlets working properly? Are the curb and gutter sections working the way that they need to be? Because sometimes we get so used to driving by these things, we miss things. I know that I do. And here's one of the things that, that can be missed uh, quite often. And that is we have the inlet, but we have settlement failure right here. In other words, the water is never going to make it up over that concrete to where it needs to be. If it was built up and there was no settlement failure there, we'd want to make sure we had this clean of debris and have this area pulled back. But we can see there are issues and challenges where they laid this. What do these issues and challenges lead us to? Well, sometimes we will have brand new construction. For example, we will we'll have driveways or we'll have parking lots at retail locations and they can end up looking just like this. 
And so my question for you all again to weigh in, how does a shopping center entrance end up with that much water right there? What could be an issue that has caused this to happen? Go ahead and weigh in there in the chat right. box. Storm inlets clogged, clogged catch basins, mm -hmm. blocked inlet, no inlet, clogged underside site system, grate is clogged, runoff from parking lot is not managed, no detention pond, clogged inlet, no basin, not enough basins or inlets, crushed pipe, lack of drainage planning, low spot with in, no inlet, wrong grades, main water break, too much mm. impervious area, clogged inlets, overwhelmed mm -hmm. storm sewer, sediment controls never removed, low point, not enough capacity, poor class dope with entrance, parking lot allowed to drain into roadway, natural low point, not enough drainage to keep up, new basins installed at incorrect elevations. And each one of those things very well could be the culprit. It could be more than one thing. And one of the issues that we have is what is considered private property, what is in the right of way, what is something that we're required to maintain. And as we go through this, uh, these webinars, we're going to talk about what happens when a private owner or a commercial business owner has clogged drains and then the water flows out into the roadway. What are our responsibilities? How do we as a local agency, city, county, municipality, uh, state agency, DOT, whatever it is, how do we address these issues and at what point do we need to get involved and, and another way of looking at it at what point are we required to get involved we'll deal with that as we look at uh, some more rural things as we go through as well here's a slope drain um, hopefully if that's pulled back and it's clean the water should flow properly we talked about special drainage features a little bit earlier again it's one way to get the water off the roadway and gets it down and out to a more vegetative uh, surface, it gets the water away. Now we'll talk about uh, some swamp areas, some high quality waters, and sometimes we'll use these to get the water to those areas. We talked uh, just a few minutes earlier about making sure we keep everything pulled back, make sure we keep everything clean. Obviously, this is going to be a bit of a problem for the water to flow where it needs to go to go into the grate. And when I worked at Public Works, one of the real challenges was some people, especially when it was leaf season, would decide to put all their leaves into the gutter section, which was a complete pain in the backside, which means we had to either suck it out or blow it out. And depending on who you are and where you are and what your policy is, you may already do that. For us, it was a very difficult job uh, to get all these things cleaned out. We actually had one time where someone set their leaves on fire in the gutter. We're still not completely sure why they thought that was a good idea, but when dealing with homeowners, you just never know uh, what you're going to get. We talked about drainage components quite a bit uh, this afternoon. If they're working together, they form a drainage system. But from what we can tell and from what we've seen, if any part of this system breaks down, something is blocked, something maybe there's deterioration around the inlet so the water's not flowing properly, it's not getting where it needs to go, or if it's filled with debris, or maybe it's a shoulder area that's not been seated very well and it's, it's just not doing a good job of getting the water off the road and it becomes an unsafe area for the motorist to pull off, then we're going to see overall the roadway itself is going to begin uh, to deteriorate. We're going to have cracking. We talked about alligator cracking. In some cases, sometimes it doesn't have alligator cracking. Sometimes there are large chunks of the road that tend to come out. So we want to make sure that we are maintaining every aspect of our, of our drainage system. To that end, there are really three parts to drainage as a system. You know, you have a design policy that we fall under. What are the proper construction uh, standards of building that drainage system? But again, the third, and to me, one of the most important aspects is, are we setting it up for future generations or the people that come behind us to be able to maintain what we've actually built? Our design, our constructing it properly, making sure it's maintainable. Those are fundamental to having a, a really good roadway drainage system. Uh, the numbers are for every dollar spent on your roadway drainage system, it saves about $4 in overall maintenance. I've always believed the less we can spend and still have a robust system, the better. Uh, money's not rolling in to our departments, so we need to do as much as we can, oftentimes with as little resources as we can or a few people 
as we can. So we want to make sure that our drainage system is, is being maintained properly so it's not costing us more to fix um, in the future. What are some of the, what are some of the drainage maintenance ideas we need to look at? Well, we need to make sure the pavement surfaces are being maintained. What does that mean? That means water is getting off of the roadway. We want to make sure that where the pavement and the shoulder joints meet, that there is there's no trash, there's no debris, uh, the slope is proper in the way it needs to be. Where the pavement and the gutter joints meet, we want to make sure there are no cracks, no issues there. The actual shoulder surfaces, we need to make sure they're crack free. Uh, make sure our ditches are pulled the way that they need to be. They're clear of debris. Our culverts, both pipe and box, are free of debris and are flowing properly. We use subsurface drains. We talked about curbs and gutters, and we touched a little bit on uh, drop inlets and catch basins uh, here just a little while ago. You can see the water flowing along the edge of the pavement right here, but unfortunately, what you can also see is we can see where the pavement and the drop off is and that water is seeping over it's infiltrating over into the travel way we need to come in we need to build this back up and make sure the shoulders allow for the water to drain not onto the roadway but away from the roadway now here's one example i guess where the water it's going to flow along the edge of the pavement it definitely is out and away from the roadway but the problem is you see the damage that has already taken place again more than likely larger vehicles semis pulling off there into that shoulder area causing that not just a divot but those massive chunks and holes let me give you a little bit better picture of it if i can if you go a little further up that roadway you can see where the roadway is here was the paved shoulder and you can see the drop off is significant right there you can see the cracking that is taking place in that shoulder area because of the drop off that is in place Again, that water has got to be gotten off the roadway, but unfortunately, we're already experiencing cracking down this shoulder area. And one other section of road I want to show you looks like this. If you go a little further up, you can see the water's flowing down, but you can see that's a massive drop off. And not only for drainage issues, but for safety issues. Again, I'll use the example of my wife and her Caribbean blue Kia Soul that she loves and is so proud of. I don't know that she would survive that drop off. I'm quite certain the car wouldn't survive that type of drop off. So we want to make sure that we get this fixed as soon as possible. Um, get this area uh, repaired because again, as water fills this gully, this valley right here, where does the water go? Well, it gets it gets absorbed underneath the pavement and begins to wash away. So over time, this issue that we see here is going to cause huge issues of what we see over there. And again, you can see from the other side how the, the water ran down and some of the, the damage and issues that we've had. We talked a little bit about the uh, turning radius coming out of that uh, gas station, that convenience store, a few slides back. Here's just a very basic low shoulder with standing water. Someone mentioned uh, in one of their answers the, uh, the, the off-roading, the off-tracking. Where I used to live in Florida, I had to, we was on a two lane road, so I would come down the road, turn on my left to turn signal and wait for traffic so I could pull into my subdivision. But inevitably, there would be one or two or more people behind me who did not like the fact that I was turning on my turn signal. So they would go around me to get on down the road. Well, that's fine. They were in a hurry. Sometimes they didn't say the nicest things about me. That's okay. But what they didn't understand they were doing is they were causing areas for water to gather and then to infiltrate underneath the roadway. And we can see where we have cracks and chunks happening here. It's only going to increase over time. We want to make sure we get that shoulder filled uh, as soon as possible, get rid of that drop off. Uh, someone talked about uh, very early on in one of their answers about the shoulder not being maintained, not just for drainage systems only, but when there's guardrail involved, and we don't maintain the shoulder for drainage purposes, all that stuff being pushed back up underneath the guardrail, if a vehicle veers off the road, loses control, hits the guardrail, if there's too much buildup in front of the guardrail, it could cause a vaulting hazard over the guardrail. That way the guardrail never gets the opportunity to do what it was designed for and installed to do. We wanna make sure we keep this maintained so that our drainage uh, system and all the components involved do not interfere with our guardrail system, our safety system there. 
Here's a really good example of a low shoulder that's been repaired and fixed. It looks really good and I like this, but I've referenced this a couple of times today as well. And that is we have holes we have where large trucks pull off the side of the road. And you can see what they're already causing. We have a massive hole right there. I don't anticipate these vehicles not pulling off there uh, in the future. We're probably going to have more of these taking place because with the types of loads and the type of volume we have on the roadway, it's very hard to design for what we have on the roadway. So we need to get this fixed as quickly as possible. Again, you can see some cracks going down the road as well where that large vehicle is pulled off. We talked about compaction and we will talk about it in detail uh, in the latter two webinars. Here's what I mean by the material is not compacted properly. So we know we compact the material underneath the roadway before we put the pavement down. But on the shoulder way, we need to make sure that our material is being compacted. What does it mean by compacted? We get that as tight as possible, we get it flat, we get it smooth so that a vehicle pulling off on that shoulder has no issue nor concern of perhaps hitting that little trench right there and vaulting over or rolling over or not hitting the guardrail and allowing the guardrail to do what it needs to do. Here's some standing water around an island. It could be the shoulders, uh, or rather it could be that there's not a crown on the road. Maybe this island's a little bit too high and there may not be a drainage system. Uh, in place to handle the waterway that would need to be addressed. Uh, this is over by a, a, a DOT maintenance yard. We know that we have large vehicles coming in and out and the turning radius may not be there. And then we have issues coming uh, where we have holes and, and such. And again, they're going to have pavement issues outside of their maintenance yard. We have a curb and gutter section here that is blocked. All that needs to be cleared back and cleaned out of the way uh, to make sure the water will flow properly. And just in reviewing a little bit here, we talked about having the shoulders and having seed putting down. Well, here's here's an area where they need to have seed put down. And what would that look like? Well, it looked like a little bit something uh, like that. The shoulder's been reseeded. Um, depending on where you are and what your specs call for, you may use a wood barrier underneath your guardrail, and that's fine. I know several states do that. If you're going to use it, you have to make sure that that stays maintained. It stays clean and free of debris because if there's debris, the water is not going to go and uh, it's not going to be managed by the drainage uh, system the way it's supposed to. Here's an example, and you may do this where you're from, you may not, but curb underneath guardrail, there are some places that do that. Um, that looks good. Unfortunately, we have to be very careful with our maintenance program because it can end up looking a little something like this. So the water's not flowing. You can see it's just not functioning the way that we want it to do. And if we have a curb failure, it can end up being a massive problem where we have water infiltrating in different areas and it's not going where we want. To that point, we talked earlier about slope failures and this is the best example I could give you of one. We talked about that, but let me show you the backside of it. You can see there's, there's one post there. That's not gonna do the job to keep a vehicle from going into that ravine, into that slope. So you wanna make sure that we keep this built up, we keep the drain functioning properly. In terms of maintenance, we talked about uh, sealing cracks that are in the roadway. We wanna make sure we get those things poured as quickly as possible. And to that end, I wanna talk about the very last thing that is on our agenda, and that is worker safety. And this is not a work zone class, but we are going to touch on work zone just for a moment. When we put up our portable changeable message sign, our PCMS, and we have caution, 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 what does that tell you as a motorist? Someone who works in transportation, who deals with this, I don't know how you read it, but when I see caution, 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 it looks to me like a bunch of wasted space and wasted words because you haven't really given me anything or any idea of what's coming nor what I should do, the recommendation I would give you is do not use the three word caution, caution, caution. Give the motorist very clear direction on what's up ahead and what it is they need to do. We don't want to just throw these three words out there because we've wasted an opportunity depending on how fast the motorists are going, depends on how many of the phases they're going to see anyway. So please make sure you don't waste time on those things right there. 
If you go to South Carolina, just south of where I am, you'll see these floating around, these bumper stickers, drive carefully, my daddy works here. They have the Let Them Work, uh, Let Them Live campaign uh, still to this day. And to that, I wanna do one, one more final interaction with everyone. I'm gonna put a slide up here. And this is about worker safety in a work zone. Let's say we're doing some drainage work and we have to set up a work zone. I'm gonna give everyone about 15 to 20 seconds. I want you to type in the chat box everything you can see wrong in this picture. And I will start my, my mental clock in four, three, two, one, go. Everything while, that you can see wrong. While they're doing that, I'm gonna give you a couple questions. Sure. Um, is there a source or research project that can reference the four to one data? Federal Highway does have some documentation. If you want to reach out to me with an email, I can get that get that information to you. I'm very happy to do that. I'll reach out to you and get it to everybody. And then Great. someone wants to know how how do you eliminate the drop off problem? But you have lots of other comments coming in right now, so I'm gonna start reading those off. Um, no sure. hard hat flagger flagger sitting flagger not standing guy sitting down no advance warning of work zone sitting flagger can't see worker flaggers hiding. Um, worker in the traveled roadway, not behind truck, truck not off roadway, flagger not protected, no exit route, crouched down by vehicle, not easily seen from a distance, no signage prior to the work zone, um, flagger blocking the road, flagger not standing, flagger next to vehicle, not enough cones and proper sign height, flagger is sitting and hard to see, flagger sitting down, not visible, and yeah, they're all getting it about the flagger being sitting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And, there's some pretty entertaining and, comments in here. And, too, and, I'm not going to read off. <laughs> Sorry. A little um, clever. Drive, a little clever never hurt anyone. Um, a driveway's blind. Yeah. You got it. Not so, wearing reflective yeah, so gear. Lot, yeah. There's a lot of things. He doesn't have his high vis gear on. It's certainly not a class two or class three vest, depending on what your standards, whether you're following MUTCD or you have the uh, state supplement. Um, there's a lot going on here. I'd like to point out just two things on top of what everyone else has said because I think everyone is absolutely on target. Notice I don't see any signs coming down that road. Um, I see a post-mounted sign, which means post-mounted signs are long-term projects. That doesn't look like a long-term project. I'm going to guess that's a sign that's there all the time. So there are no signs warning me as a motorist to come up the road. He's very lucky that that motorist is in a small vehicle. If that were a larger vehicle, who knows if that, if that vehicle, that driver is able to see him crouch down like that and notice here's a vehicle coming through the work area and he has no idea what's coming behind him this is not the way we want you set up a, a work zone or a flagger operation please give your people the opportunity to be safe i know when we're doing these jobs sometimes it feels like it takes longer to put out the signs than it does to actually do the job i do get that there are some some ways we can mitigate that in the mutcd but in general please 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 set your work zone up your traffic control properly give your workers a chance to do the work that they can because we have no idea if these motorists are paying attention or if they're distracted drivers give your people the chance to get out of the way or be completely off the roadway if possible so that we don't have uh, another statistic uh, am amongst us uh, last couple of things on worker safety you have an 811 system go ahead and call it before you start doing anything. We talked about uh, proper work zone traffic control. You need to make sure your people are up on their trenching operations. They got an escape route. Unlike the dumb and dumber picture that we showed at the very outset of this presentation, please don't walk under the loads. We talked about avoiding any hazards or getting caught uh, with any pinch points. This is gonna come up uh, on Thursday. Loose material tripping hazards. When we dig a hole and we trench it, get stuff in it as soon as possible. Close that hole up as soon as you can. Um, because if there's loose material or there's a tripping hazard, I come from a family of klutzes, I'll find a way to fall over it. So go ahead and make sure we keep those as far away from the workers as possible. And then make sure you're meeting your confined space requirements. And that's what we're going to close with today. I'm going to guess that many of you are familiar, or at least with what this is, whether you've ever seen one or experienced one in person. It's a brown recluse spider. That is considered a confined space challenge when you get down into a trench and one of those is there. My opinion, I'm not a spider person. The best spider is a dead spider. That's just me. Uh, some, depending on the areas that you're from, you may see one of these. It's very possible. Black Widow, um, 
you do not want to be bitten by one that is not a good day for you and again depending on where you are you may see a water moccasin in that trench so you want to make sure that you keep an eye out for those those are just some of the uh, the lesser talked about confined space challenges that we talk about uh, most of us go through in our OSHA classes and having said that uh, Victoria I believe there's a poll number three sure I can put that and, up and I then hope. we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take some questions I was gonna say you definitely know how to make a girl want to socially distance herself with those two spiders and that one snake <laughs> I didn't show my wife, so she still talked to me. Yes. Oh, there you go. Um, worker safety includes proper work zone setup, confined space protection, personal protective equipment, or all of the above. So, and while they're reading that, or excuse me, responding to that and getting us up to 80%, mm -hmm. I'll go back to that one question I read off earlier about how do you eliminate the drop off problem? And so I there are a couple. They, go, go ahead. ahead sorry. No, no, no. They, they there can, are. There, there are a couple issues at play with that. Uh, number one, it's very hard to change a motorist patterns or behaviors. Um, we try to tend to use negative consequences and it often doesn't work because people still speed in spite of the fact you can get very uh, uh, nasty tickets that you have to pay. So I think part of it is maybe putting up some guardrail and some things to kind of keep uh, vehicles pulling away if the guardrail is warranted. If not, it just becomes a part of the work plan of making sure that we're going out there and we're filling and we're getting compaction on it as often as possible to keep that from happening because unfortunately in some areas people are so used to doing that over the years, they're not going to stop and that just puts more pressure on us as an agency. Um, there is no 100% perfect answer. Maybe putting up some guardrail or some type of obstacle that would keep them from wanting to get too close to it However, if we go and do that and there's an obstacle, maybe we create a fixed object hazard, which depending on what state you're in could be a problem. So my recommendation to you would be just keep filling it and go ahead and, and keep getting compaction on as much as possible. Um, as many, you know, do reach out, public service announcements, whatever you can do. But unfortunately, I don't see that as a problem that can go away because of the motorist attitudes and habits. Okay. Now, I did put up the poll results why you were answering that question uh -huh. and one one percent chose proper work zone setup mm -hmm. and 99 percent chose all of the above so i'll and take I, those results down yes ma'am and i appreciate everyone that participated in the poll it is all of the above every one of those things that are listed are important components of worker safety oftentimes we, we think just the work zone well no i got to make sure i'm wearing the proper equipment do I have the proper high visibility clothing on? Do I have whatever I need in my hands to do the job? Uh, have we set up the work zone properly with our cones? Have we have we coned it off? Are we using our channelizing devices properly? That's great, but in some cases I may need ear protection. I may need eye protection. All of those things, that personal protective equipment is a factor in worker safety. If we're gonna be in a trench, do we have a trench box to keep that, keep that trench from caving in at any given time? Um, it's not just about meeting OSHA standards as well. It's about keeping our people safe, uh, keeping them alive. So, you know, the goal at the end of every day, the goal is to go home and that's what we want. And having said that, that is the end. Uh, it should be about two minutes early. I went a couple of minutes longer than I wanted to. But if you have any questions, please ask them or reach out to me or reach out to Victoria and we'll assist you in any way that we can. Absolutely. And, you know, the people are just giving you kudos in the question box right now. So um, we thank you so much, Scott, for agreeing to do this webinar series. And we're definitely looking forward to the next two modules. Um, and we also give a, a call out to James Martin, who I know is the North Carolina LTAP director there and was instrumental in helping to approve you being able to do this webinar with us. So thank you. Um, we look forward to having everybody back on Thursday and then next Tuesday for the next two sections. If you didn't get the handout downloaded, I'll be emailing it out to everybody who is on here as well. So please make sure you register for those two. And with that, everybody have a great rest of your day. Thanks.